let's talk about representation. Today I'm taking the opportunity to talk about my thesis, which is all about representations of Jews, uh, and more specifically I'm going to be talking about the novel Harrington by Mariah Edgeworth. I'm going to start by reading a long excerpt from Mariah Edgeworth's 1817 novel Harrington. Uh, I think I'll read the quotation first, and then I'll explain what this is all about. About this time, I first became fond of reading. I never saw the word Jew in any page of any book which I happened to open without immediately stopping to read the passage. And here I must observe that not only in the old storybooks where the characters of Jews are as well fixed to be wicked as the bad fairies or bad genie or allegor or allegorical personifications of the devils and the vices in the old emblems, mysteries, moralities, etc. But in almost every work of fiction I found the Jews represented as hateful be beings, nay, even in modern tales of very late years. Since I have come to man's estate, I have met with books by authors professing candor and toleration, but books written expressly for the rising generations, called, if I mistake not, moral tales for young people. And even in these, whenever the Jews are introduced, I find that they are invariably represented as beings of a mean, avaricious, unprincipled, treacherous character. Even the peculiarities of their persons, the errors of their foreign dialect and, dialect and pronunciation were mimicked and caricatured as if to render them objects of per perpetual derision and detestation. I am far from wishing to insinuate that such was the serious intention of these authors. I trust they will in future profit by these hints. I simply state the fact which similar representations in the storybooks I read when I was a child produced on my mind. They certainly acted most powerfully and injuriously, strengthening the erroneous association of ideas I had accidentally formed and confirming my childish prejudice by what I then thought the indisputable authority of printed books. He starts out with this really visceral response to Jews. He's terrified of Jews at the beginning. And as he says in this passage, it's because he's read and he's absorbed all these images of Jews as demonic, devilish creatures. Uh, that experience eventually cures him of, of those notions. Now, Edgeworth wrote this novel uh, in part as a criticism of herself. When she talks about those tales, those moral tales for young people that encourage these stereotypes, even in the modern age, she's talking about stories she herself had written. She wrote the moral tales for young people. And if you look at those stories, they're easy to find if you go to Project Gutenberg. Jewish characters appear in several stories, by, uh, short stories by Mariah Edgeworth, and they're really, really awful characters. As she says in, in this passage in Harrington, it was not the author's intent to perpetuate these stereotypes or to demonize Jewish people. And what I've done in my thesis, I've really looked at that, that impulse or, or how that can happen. And my argument is essentially that Jewish characters and Jewish tropes uh, in the 18th, 19th century, or even dating back to, to Shylock in the 17th century, and again, borrowing from older medieval tropes and contemporary tropes in the uh, Renaissance era. Um, the point is these, these Jewish tropes, these, these ideas of demonic Jews have been around for a very long time. Uh, and so Edgeworth, when she's writing, she's absorbing these literary tropes about Jewish characters, about how they serve a story. They, they serve a very useful and convenient function when telling a story. And that's exactly how they operate in Mariah Edgeworth's short stories. Edgeworth was only really made aware of how problematic her depictions of Jews were when she received a letter from a Jewish reader from the United States. Uh, Rachel Mordecai was her name. She was a teacher in the United States. She was a big fan of... Edgeworth's writings, and Edgeworth, both Edgeworth and Mordecai were teachers, were educators. Edgeworth had published treatises on education. She had very forward-thinking views on how to educate children at the time. In the early 1800s, men and women received completely different types of education, if women received any education at all. And Edgeworth, along with other uh, dissenters in, uh, in England and Ireland and Scotland, believed very strongly that women should receive an education, that everybody should receive an education. Uh, and so she was a huge advocate for, for education. And so there was a strong connection, uh, shared interests between Rachel Mordecai and the work that Mariah Edgeworth had been doing. Mordecai writes this letter praising, praising Edgeworth for her sensitivity and her carefulness and her, her ideas, and only very, very mildly complaining that, at how upset she was that uh, these Jewish characters show up, right? Rachel Mordecai's Jewish woman. She's upset by seeing these Jewish characters within these works that are otherwise really wonderful. And Edgeworth really took that to heart. It's the reason she wrote Harrington, to 
try to make sense of her own prejudices of why she was able to create these these horrible Jewish characters um, when you know denigrating Jews was not at all her intention. How does that happen? And so the novel of Harrington is really an investigation of how stereotypes are perpetuated accidentally or incidentally as a matter of literary tropes. I said at the beginning that I was going to talk about representation, and I want to bring this into a modern context. So let's, I'm going to read again the, the end of that passage that I had read. These ideas certainly acted both powerfully and injuriously, strengthening the erroneous association of ideas I had accidentally formed in confirming my childish prejudice but I, by what I then thought the indisputable authority of printed books. Harrington is saying, he's the speaker here, he's saying that his negative opinions, his ability to accept stereotypes and to accept oppression results from the authority of printed books, the things he has read and absorbed, the entertainment, the media that he's exposed to prepares him to, to accept uh, the othering of Jews. And, you know, to bring it to the modern context again, I've talked about Black Lives Matters in the past, and that's kind of an argument that is being made in the as part of the Black Lives Matters movement, or at least a response to it, TV and filmmakers are thinking, well, how do we do a better job of casting people of color, of not giving them stereotypical roles, of, again, humanizing them much better in the media that's consumed. That was something writers were struggling with when it came to Jews, at least, in uh, 18th and 19th century British fiction. It's something that... Uh, you know, we always struggle with when it comes to representation of, of any people. TV, film, literature is representational. It's never the thing itself, but it informs the way we think about reality. So how do we do a better job of making sure that, that media and entertainment reflect the reality we want to be living in rather than taking the shortcuts to make easy, cheap, easy to consume 